Thursday, we began uh, this odyssey of the International Space Development Conference 2001, exploring first leaving Earth, and uh, then we moved on to orbital uh, activities, and now today we begin to look beyond Earth orbit and to the Moon and Mars, and tomorrow then culminating with the beginning of the exploration of the uh, outer planets and beyond. Our first speaker today in the plenary session is uh, Robert Gownley from NASA JPL. Uh, he will speak on the Mars program. Bob Gownley is an aerospace engineer working for NASA on JPL, on the Project Propulsion Laboratory. As a systems engineer on the Mars Exploration Rover Project, he leads engineering analysis and planning. Uh, he previously has served as flight director for the Deep Space One uh, spacecraft, testing uh, ion propulsion for interplanetary missions. Prior to this, he served as deputy engineering uh, team chief for the Galileo mission to Jupiter. For this work on Galileo, I uh, received NASA's uh, Exceptional Service and Exceptional Achievement Awards. Uh, he is a lifetime time, uh, space enthusiast and activist. He serves on the board of directors for the National Space Society. And uh, Mr. Gownley holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree uh, in aeronautics and uh, aeronautics from um, MIT. Uh, I give you a lot of I would like to thank the programming organizers for this convention, Mr. Seifert and Mr. Freeman. I think they've done an extraordinary job here. And I would like to give a special note of thanks to Arthur C. Clarke, Stanley Kubrick, Bob McCall, Fred Ordway, and a and a cast of thousands who brought us movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, because in 1969, a 12-year-old kid saw that movie, emerged wide-eyed, and today, that same kid, who really is at heart, is standing before you talking about Mars exploration in 2001. I contend that is not a coincidence. <laughs> and I suspect that many of you are also here for similar reasons. May I have the first slide, please? I'm here to talk about Mars exploration, and I want to begin by saying it is time to go back. I'm sure many of you remember this picture that Mars Pathfinder took, the first picture that showed we really were back on Mars. This was in 1997. We've had a number of ups and downs since then, and I'm here to tell you the past, the present, and what is yet to come. It is an exciting story. May I have the next slide, please? The history of American Mars exploration begins back in the 1960s. Then, uh, in the early days, we had the Mariner series of spacecraft just flying past Mars, giving us some tantalizing glimpses. We learned early on that Mars was considerably more complicated than we imagined. It had a few surprises. The atmosphere was thinner than we expected, and we were surprised to discover craters of all things. This was sort of a foreboding vision, considering we, some of us still clung to the Edgar Rice Burroughs version of Mars with Martians and uh, green fields. But we learned more. Mariner 9 went in orbit around Mars, as did the Viking orbiters, giving us a complete map of the planet. Most exciting of all was the 76 landing of two Viking landers. There we got did the first tentative test to see if there was life on Mars. The consensus, still contested, was negative. And then there came a long silence. Because Viking was sort of the top of the pyramid. There were other places to explore, other places to go. And it took some ingenuity to try to get another Mars mission started after the great successes of these missions. Next slide, please. The mission that was going to bring America back to Mars 
was Mars Observer. After, after a rocky series of, of starts, it was uh, originally started in the 1980s. It was going to launch in the space shuttle. Challenger delayed it. Finally launched in 1992 and was almost to Mars. Now, Mars Observer carried a large series of instruments to map Mars in far greater detail gather information about the atmosphere, gather information about the geochemistry of the surface. It was a far more sophisticated in instrument complement than had ever gone to the planet before. And as I'm sure many of you know, it was lost suddenly, catastrophically, unable to determine what the cause was, but we were bound to determine to try again. Next slide, please. So, in 1996, we launched not one, but two spacecraft towards Mars. Mars Global Surveyor was designed to study Mars using many of the same instruments that were originally scheduled for the Mars Observer spacecraft. It launched in 96 and went into orbit in 1997, where it is taking enormous amounts of data and turning the scientists' heads around with great scientific findings. I was humbled to hear Arthur C. Clarke make reference to the astonishing photographs. I have a few at the table close to the lectern here. You're welcome to uh, take one after the program is over. It has opened our eyes about what the possibilities are for future Martian exploration, even revealing signs of relatively recent activity from liquid water, still controversial but enough to draw a lot of interest. Not to be forgotten, that same year we launched Mars Pathfinder to Mars, and this was one of the great shining moments in space exploration history. Along with many friends, I was in JPL the day we returned to Mars as a, with a lander, and when we first opened that shutter and saw that the rover was landed, everything was safe, everything was working, it, it, was, it was proof that man was meant to be there. We are going to go back, we're going to go back often. And great discoveries were made that day. A small rover was deployed, cruised around the lander, took pictures of the surroundings, and people forget that this mission was only scheduled to last for five days. It lasted for almost 90. We greatly exceeded our expectations. Next slide, please. As if all that weren't enough, around the same time, scientists examining a meteorite that uh, we've established came from Mars noticed some curious features in the minerals. Very small, but very suggestive, I'm going to call for my words carefully, very suggestive of lifelike forms that had been in there. All of a sudden, the possibility of studying the biology of Mars becomes very, very compelling. It had sort of been lurking underneath that, you know, maybe, perhaps, billions of years ago, when conditions were a little more habitable. Perhaps Mars had started life much as Earth did, but just was not able to sustain it. And this was the first thing that people could point to to say that there is some basis for that speculation. It compels further examination. Next slide, please. This became the impetus of a long-term plan to study planet Mars, with life being one of the major driving elements, would begin by doing a thorough map of Mars, learning where water, which is the common thread in all Mars exploration, find the water, you find some of the most interesting mineralogy, information about climate, and future utilization. Map that, do some selective landings to gather information and eventually bring a sample of Mars back for close examination. Next slide, please.
I mentioned that there is a common thread, water. More important than anything else, knowing where the water is or was on Mars tells us a great deal about what its history was and how we may explore it better in the future. It all comes down to learning where the source of light came from, you need water, how the climate was driven, water is important there. And notice down in the bottom there the words utilization. The implication there being that uh, we will be using Martian resources for further explanation unmanned or manned. Next slide, please. So with this as our guidepost, we established a blueprint in the mid-90s, taking advantage of the two-year opportunities when Mars is at its closest. In 1998, we would launch two spacecraft to Mars, one of them a lander, another of them an orbiter designed to take data on the atmosphere. Two years later, followed by another orbiter, another lander, the orbiter would carry the last of the instruments that was to fly a Mars observer, and the lander would also deploy a small rover. 2003, we would deploy a lander that would begin to take samples of the planet. 2005, followed up with another lander, another sample return, and eventually bring it back to Earth in the latter part of this decade, and here on Earth, scientists would be able to hold a piece of Mars and see what it's about. This was an ambitious, a challenging, and a scientifically driven schedule. And we were gung-ho to do it. In the interest of trying to get the most for the dollar, we tried to economize and make the best use of the resources we had. And so, as a goalpost, we had budgeted about the same amount of money for the two missions going to Mars in 1998 as we had for all the Mars Pathfinder mission. Next slide, please. And this was to lead to a series of small delays because neither Mars Surveyor mission succeeded in, in accomplishing their goals. The Mars Climate Orbiter failed to go into orbit around Mars. It was traced to uh, some errors in ground control that have since been thoroughly examined, and we will not make those mistakes again. The Mars Lander failed because of inadequate testing. There was a small software bug. We did not catch it. We will not make that mistake again. And two microprobes that were designed to separate away from the lander were not we're down found again. These were high risk items. Of all these, we thought that those might be the ones that had the, the remotest chance of full success. They were lost as well. The key lesson from all this is that we must not take Mars for granted. It is a challenge. It requires the best of our efforts. And sometimes we just have to take our breath and think things through a little more carefully each time. So from this, we had to sort of go back to the rock pile and begin chipping away at rocks to try to think of what to do next. Next slide, please. Of course, when JPLers go away to sort of chip away at rocks, we have to do it in a grand fashion. Uh, this sh shows a depiction of an early 80s version of a Mars rover. We realized that we needed to take a step back understand better how to explore the planet without making some of the mistakes we had in the past, but to do so in an aggressive way. So we went back to fundamentals. Rovers give fantastic capabilities to explore the planet. You're not limited to just one location. You can move about, take your instruments where they look the most interesting. It is an exciting and invigorating program. So the decision was made that we would launch a series of new landers to Mars that would be more sophisticated than what we had anticipated that we would be doing at this stage, but still maintain the general focus that we will bring back samples from Mars. It will just be a little bit later. May I have the next slide, please? 
So we have a new timeline. Again, every two years, in 2001, we will continue our exploration of Mars with Mars Odyssey, which launched in April. I'm sure many of you are tracking its progress. It's doing well. 2003, a project, one that I'm privileged to work on, called Mars Exploration Rover, where not one, but two separate spacecraft are going to go to Mars, deploy rovers, and explore different areas and range for a long way to send that data back. 2005, we're going to study Mars in far, more great, in far greater scrutiny. Previously, we had to make do with resolutions on the order of meters and tens of meters. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, reconnaissance, you know, think spy sat, this will have resolutions down to 20 centimeters. We will be able to unambiguously identify hazardous areas, the sort of thing that threatened the landing of Mars Polar Lander, and we hope will no longer threaten us because we'll know exactly what the rock distribution is. Following that in 2007, by a joint mission with the Italian Space Agency to provide additional telecom support, the French Space Agency, CNES, will are also planning to send rovers rather, excuse me, send orbiters to Mars. And we may start deploying a series of smart landers and rovers that will be able to range even farther and help support our exploration and start a series of, of scout missions to afford it, fill in niches that are not otherwise filled by the larger missions. Ultimate, all of this ultimately leading to a Mars sample return. Next slide, please. And this new program is underway right now. The mission called Mars Odyssey, appropriately for 2001, is on its way to Mars. And once in orbit, it will deploy a science instrument, the gamma ray spectrometer, whose abilities are to actually measure the mineral composition of the surface of Mars. It can detect gamma rays from radioactive isotope decay, it can also measure concentrations of water, very valuable in knowing where, where to find more interesting locations. We know there is water around the poles. We would like to get a better sense of where the water is located, if it is at all, a little closer to the equatorial regions. Also of note on this is the Themis mission. It will gather information about the surface of Mars in the infrared give us a nice spectra, again, to improve our knowledge of the mineralogy of Mars. But uh, not mentioned on this slide is an instrument package called MARIE. MARIE is designed to gather data on the amount of radiation that the spacecraft encounters on the trip to Mars and in orbit. This radiation data will help future astronauts know just how much shielding, how much protection they need so that they can arrive at Mars and return safely. Next slide, please. The mission that I'm working on, Mars Exploration Rover, will launch in 2003, send two rovers at two different locations on Mars, locations to be determined, but the key is to tr explore areas that were visited by water and see what we can learn to support future Mars sample return missions. Whereas Mars Pathfinder's rover Sojourner traveled tens of meters in its entire course of three months, over the three month mission of each Mars rover, we expect to travel at least one kilometer, sample a half dozen different rocks, take large panoramas, and as much as we can with the limitations on solar power and other consumables, we will try to keep the rovers going as long as possible. And it would absolutely thrill me if we finally end our days looking out across some vast canyon and sort of uh, lose contact in a very poetic setting. I think this depiction here really, really stills, steals this romantic person's heart. Next slide, please. 
It would be unfair if I didn't mention that in 2003 there is a whole armada of spacecraft going to Mars. At the same, near the same time would be a Japanese spacecraft called Nozomi, otherwise known as Planet B. Uh, it's designed to study the fields and particles around Mars. It uh, will be communicating at about the same time. We'll all be sharing the resources of the Deep Space Network to try to return all the data that we can. It's going to be a very, very busy time because we'll have both Mars Global Surveyor still operating, Mars Odyssey, two Mars rovers, Nozomi, and next slide, please. A European mission called Mars Express. Now, Mars Express is built by the French, but it contains a additional landing vehicle called Eagle 2 that is being built by the British. It is a very small, compact lander, and it's, it's designed to be Europe's first exploration of the surface of Mars, and we all wish them well. Next slide, please. Again, in 2005, we will send a Mars reconnaissance order. This is an artist's depiction. The design is still being formalized, but key amongst it will be a large imaging telescope designed to look for surface features as small as 20 centimeters. If there is an obstacle, we will find it. Next slide, please. In the same time period, we want to develop a series of scout missions. These would be small, tightly focused missions. Uh, this shows one that uh, just plops down, again, using airbags. I, I failed to mention that uh, in 2003, we will be returning to the airbag series of landing that we used for Mars Pathfinder, whereas Viking and Mars Bora Lander used more conventional rockets. Given our current understanding of Mars and our ability to move around at the last minute if we detect uh, rocky landing airbags, we have a lot of advantages. But the key with the Mars scout missions is to be small and fast and cheap, have very specific objectives. This shows just one example. Other possible designs would be a balloon that could float about, collect some data on the surface a small airplane that could fly about, gather data for a slightly smaller amount of time, and other missions designed to do very small, very specific things and keep the flow of data going while the larger missions are, are planned and developed. Next slide, please. And this shows a progression of how the rovers have been developing. Mars. Pathfinder had a rover that was not very much wider than the lectern I'm standing at. Mars rover, the mission I'm working on, has a rover that's roughly the size of this table. Subsequent missions that may launch as early as 2007 would be perhaps the size of this entire platform designing to go farther, gather more data, and learn about Mars in preparation for bringing back a sample. Next slide, please. We are going to take the lessons that we've learned from the Mars Polar Lander and design more sophisticated landers, ones that can better handle any imperfections in the terrain or be able to move aside and find that one sweet spot amongst the rock field and plop down safely and deploy a rover there. Next slide, please. All this tends to make me a little giddy. Just want to stare at, contemplate a sunset, and imagine what lies before us. This is about as far as I can explicitly say we have plans, we have commitments, but I'm sure, like all of you, we'd like to look one step beyond. Next slide, please and contemplate what the future may hold. I'll be happy to take questions. Could we have the lights up, please? Do we have any questions here? Yes, sir. 
The question was, will any of the landers have a microphone? That is still open. Uh, the mission that I'm working on now, Mars Exploration Rover, is so packed that we looked at it, we were not able to support adding any additional equipment. In fact, we're tightly stressed to make do with the space that we have. Mars Power Lander was to carry a microphone to Mars. It was a joint project with the Planetary Society. I, I don't know when that will happen, but I can guarantee that the Planetary Society will, will knock on our door. Other question, over here. Are you considering the possibility of putting RTG nuclear power sources on any of the landers to be uh, The question was, are we considering radioisotope thermoelectric generators, otherwise known as RTGs for future rovers? Yes, that is being re-examined. You may have noticed on the picture of a larger rover, it conspicuously showed some nuclear material. This is a very touchy subject because carrying nuclear material carries a lot of obligations for NASA. We have to go through many more reviews, uh, assure that there is no possibility of harm, even in the most remote accident. And it's not a step we would take lightly, but it is on the table. It can certainly creates some opportunities that solar alone does not have. You're not tied to the local time of day. You can operate reliably for years, Mars, uh, the Mars mission Viking did that with nuclear, but again, a lot of uh, added work would have to be done. And up here. Are any of the landers going to carry instruments that possibly might go The question was, will any of the instruments carry uh, the ability to detect microscopic organisms? Uh, the answer to your question, the Mars Rover Project, I should have said a little bit more about, contains a mechanical arm with a Swiss Army knife of scientific instruments. Some of them designed to measure the composition of the material, uh, another of them to actually rasp away at the surface and see what's underneath. One of them will contain a small microscope, able to take pictures and uh, see what the material looks like. I should point out that the Mars rock that you saw that had some tantalizing indications of life required an electron microscope, something much smaller than we think we'd be able to detect. But if, 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 there, if there are fossilized algae there, this engineer will jump out of his seat. Uh, well, actually, I'll probably look towards the scientists that are over in the corner and see them jumping out of the seat first. I'm just, I'm just the lowly technician in this whole process. Way back there. Could you, could you explain how an airplane mission might unfold? How it would be deployed and how it would gather its information and how that would come back to Earth? Okay, the question was, how might a Mars airplane mission work? Uh, the studies have been done speculated that as Martian spacecraft were descending through the atmosphere, it would open up and deploy a winged spacecraft that would have a small engine enough to keep it going. It would rely on orbiting spacecraft to gather high amounts of data. It would have a relatively short mission life, but it would be designed to focus in and sweep in on some areas. We don't think we could keep it going for very long, but it would give us some spot checks of uh, some places that might otherwise be inaccessible. I think we have time for two more questions. Back here in the yellow. Do any of your uh, long-term plans include attempts to land in the polar regions? Uh, the question was, do any of the current plans call for landing in the polar regions? Right now, that is not on the plate because the Mars rover missions, which is the next scheduled landing mission, are going to be limited to the polar regions. It's just the constraints of the orbital geometry make it very hard to get to the poles, but certainly that would be re-examined for future missions, but uh, today I cannot point to a time. Right now I'm keen to find out where the scientists, uh, people like Al Haldeman, are going to recommend where to put the spacecraft down. And over here with the video. What is going to be done with the, you didn't mention, abandoned Mars 2001 lander and the experiments that aren't being modified Okay, the question was the Mars 01 lander. 
that was originally scheduled. Recall on an earlier view graph, uh, there were going to be two spacecraft going to Mars at this time. Given our experience with Mars Polar Lander, NASA did not feel comfortable trying to put a lander down on Mars the same way, and it would be too rushed, which we learned can have harsh consequences, to try to modify what we had already built. One of many of the instruments that were going to land in 01 are going to be used in 03 in, in future missions. And in fact, the rover that we're putting on Mars in 03 is considerably more capable than the one that we would have launched in 01. We expect to be able to do all the scientific investigations that we had planned uh, with the mission that was canceled spread out over several missions for the rest of this decade. And at this point, I think I am run out of time and uh, Hope you all have a wonderful convention. I'm having a great time. Our second speaker for today is uh, Jim Benson from uh, Space Development Incorporated. Uh, we'll speak on commercial missions to uh, near Earth orbit and uh, lunar commercial Martian, uh, missions. Uh, Mr. Benson is the founder and CEO of Space Dev Incorporated. <laughs> Space Dev is uh, defining and executing low-cost missions to Earth orbit, the uh, moon and beyond. Uh, prior to founding Space Dev, Mr. Benson was founder and president of the CompuSearch uh, software systems and ImageFast, uh, both of McLean, Virginia. <clears throat> and in 1995, Jim sold his uh, business uh, in McLean, and in 1997, he decided to accept the challenge of starting an entrepreneurial space commercialization venture, uh, which combines his lifelong interests in, uh, in science, technology, and astronomy uh, with uh, his successful business experience. Uh, in February 1998, space uh, Dev acquired Integrated Space Systems of San Diego, a company consisting of rocket and aerospace engineers. And Mr. Benson is vice chair and the private sector representative on NASA's National Space Grant Review Board. I'll give you Jim Benson. Thank you very much. Uh, we're starting about 10 minutes late, so I'll just uh, uh, shorten up by about 10 minutes. I can talk real fast if you all can listen fast. Um, boy, I just I just feel like we're almost overwhelmed by insurmountable opportunities here. There are just so many things going on. We've got Alan Binder back here, the father of the Lunar Prospector, who's going to be talking pretty soon, and David Cook over here is going to be talking about uh, opportunities in uh, near-Earth asteroids, and we've got uh, people wanting to go to Mars, and there's just so many things happening. What a lot of people don't realize is there are three ways of exploring the solar system. One way is through government missions. Another way is through private missions. And the third way is through a combination. I don't believe that many people understand that private deep space and planetary missions can be done today and can be done inexpensively. I came to the conclusion that they can be done in 1996-1997 after uh, spending a year and a half of, of research and I've spent the first two million dollars trying to work with NASA to do a commercial deep space mission to a near-Earth asteroid just like NEAR except do different science of equal value and bring back uh, scientific information at a lower cost and sell that information to uh, that scientific data to NASA for less than they're paying for flying their own missions and make a small profit and use that to fly additional missions. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that theory whatsoever, except it just doesn't work because there are people in NASA that don't want it to work. Now, that's not true at the top levels. The top levels of NASA understand that these things can be done and that it makes sense wherever possible to stretch the budget dollar because NASA's budget has been pretty flat and the space station and the shuttle pretty much eat up the entire budget, leaving just crumbs left over for 
uh, exploration, whether it's manned or unmanned. So when you look at near-Earth asteroid rendezvous costing $250 million and having five instruments on it, 250 million divided by five is $50 million per data set. That's what we, the taxpayers, pay to get scientific data back from Eros. As you'll see, I'm going to go through just a few slides uh, in a second to show you the evolution of what it takes to actually get a company going that is physically capable of going out and doing missions beyond Earth orbit, which had never been done before. So it's a pioneering uh, effort in that sense as well. Now, what I have found is it's very easy for people to simply issue a press release and form a website saying they're going to do a lunar orbiter, or issue a press release and do a website and uh, have three part-time guys saying they're going to do, you know, something else. And believe me, it's not that easy. You don't conduct space exploration through websites and press releases. It's hard as hell, <laughs> and it's uh, and it's not very cheap to do either. I'm going to see if I can move a microphone around so I can see the uh, screen. Okay. Uh, first off, I want to say that we're involved in three Mars missions right now. Uh, we talked Boeing into getting interested in the Mars sample return architecture study. And uh, once they got interested, they decided to bring us on as a team member, uh, which is very nice of them. We went in there with our chief technology officer, who's a 30-year JPL veteran named Dave Smith, who was part of the Mars program until he retired from JPL and came on board as our chief technology officer. So having a company with uh, key management people is important to get anything in life done, but it's also important for raising money because I always look at people, people, people. We're also involved in under contract with a company that is bidding on the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. So if they win, we'll be playing a significant role in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we're also involved in the Mars Ascent Vehicle because there are problems with uh, liquid rockets uh, being inapplicable from the surface of the Mars to get the sample back up off the surface, and there are also other uh, serious problems with solid rocket motors, and it may be that space desk hybrid rocket motors uh, turn out to be a solution to that so far intractable problem. So space desk is actively involved in three Mars missions right now. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to walk you through a very short history of uh, what it takes to get up to speed in a company that actually can go out and do missions and not just talk about them. It's a, it's a lot of work. I spent the first year and a half on my own just learning and studying because my background is a geology uh, major who never did any geology, but I spent 30 years in the computer field. So I had to learn a lot about space and the technology. So that was the first year and a half. And then in January of 97, we had three professors, 10 students, and 12 industry mentors who spent eight months uh, simulative, coming up with a commercial alternative to NEAR, which we call NEAP, Near Earth Asteroid Prospector. And we did a mission design, we did a spacecraft design, we costed it out, we created a detailed work breakdown structure, and we came to the conclusion that a simple mission to a near Earth object can be done for less than 15 not 50, less than one five million dollars. And if it had two science instruments on it, we'd be bringing back scientific data at 7.5 million dollars a pop instead of 50 million dollars a pop. And Dr. Wes Huntress, who was then the Office of Space Science Director, three and a half million dollar budget, liked it so much, the idea of commercial deep space science missions, he significantly changed the discovery program in ways that allowed and permitted, even encouraged commercial deep space uh, science missions. Uh, that's as far as he and Dan Golden could take it, and uh, the peer review committee, which is supposed to be uh, scientific and objective, is anything but that. It's loaded with politics. And uh, I got a phone call during the peer review process late one night from an insider on one of the peer review committees, and he said, Jim, you won't believe what's going on here. We've got, we've got uh, review members saying, what is this commercial mission bullshit, to quote, we can't allow this, and they basically found uh, excuses for um, 
knocking down the three proposals that have been submitted by three different universities, one of them, Red Whitaker, teamed with JPL itself on the nano rover. So after spending uh, eight months and coming to the conclusion that such missions could be done profitably for less than $15 million, that's what encouraged me in the fall of 97 uh, to form the company spaced out. Uh, next slide, please. Then um, you can just see a couple of quotes here. I won't, uh, I won't dwell on them, but Dr. Steve Ostro, the world's leading radar astronomer, astronomer JPL, is the one who um, encouraged me in the very beginning in 1996 and introduced me to Dr. John Lewis, uh, who became a very influential in terms of uh, resources that are in the Earth space, which opened my horizon even broader than just bringing back scientific data, because I am a geologist and I am a business guy, and the, the resources in outer space that are easy to get to are just absolutely beyond imagination. You can't even add it up. One of them, one asteroid alone, near Earth asteroid, can be worth $80 trillion, and there are 100 million of them between Earth and Mars. We're living in the, on the edge of a minor asteroid belt. Uh, next slide, please. So then after the uh, 97, eight-month uh, mission, then we, um, let's see, I skipped something here. We hired Tony Spear, who was the Mars Pathfinder Project Manager, in the summer of 98 to review our mission design, spacecraft design, and costs, and he gave us a clean bill of health and uh, brought in a, a dozen of uh, his favorite engineers, and that was uh, very encouraging to get somebody like Tony uh, on board with us. Then, uh, shortly uh, later that year, in 98 into early 99, we won a competitive contract to answer JPL's question. If you're dropped off in Earth orbit with only 200 kilograms, can you get to Mars with five different types of missions? The five different types of missions are a data relay orbiter, a, a science orbiter, and three different variations on probe carriers. One larger probe, two smaller probes, and three even smaller probes. And the answer that we came up with is that in the majority of cases with only 200 kilograms, yes, you can do those missions. There were some years that, such, uh, that some of those missions could not be done. However, since then, 75 additional kilograms has become available on the launch vehicle, so all of those Mars micro missions can be done, and they can be done easily within those limits. And we concluded that you can do these Mars missions for under $25 million. Anybody that wants to do a simple Mars mission can do it and can get it going in 18 months. It's still not too late for us to do a 2003 uh, Mars mission. And the Ames uh, Research Center would love to take their little inexpensive airplane as the probe carrier version and drop that off. Unfortunately, you don't have data communications to, to relay the data back to Earth. So at this point, we went to, uh, in early 1999, we went to my friend Mike Mott, who had been chief of staff at NASA headquarters and now was uh, vice president for business development at Boeing. And I took my team into Mike and I said, Mike, look, we have a great opportunity. We have an inside track. We've just designed these Mars micro missions and JPL's going to buy one or two of them. So we don't have the credibility of the financial backing, but we've got the technical expertise and we've already designed it. Will you team with us? And they said yes. So the RFP came out from JPL and the number one criteria for evaluation points was that you have successfully flown Mars missions. <laughs> that narrowed it down to Lockheed. And the second highest number of points went to all those companies that have successfully flown deep space missions. Well, that sort of narrowed it down to Ball and Spectrum Astro. And uh, Boeing was literally disqualified from bidding, as was Space Dev. We wrote a very uh, thoughtful and positive and encouraging letter to the contracting people at JPL and politely point out to them that it's not organizations that build spacecraft and flying missions, it's people. And we pointed out that we had people on board who had been deeply involved or run uh, 12 deep space missions and 36 Earth orbiting missions and that we felt that we had the people on board to carry it off. And they wrote back to us and said, um, it's the organizations that count and not the people. That was very disappointing. They went ahead and uh, did the uh, solicitation, and they, uh, in the meantime, while they were doing that, uh, Lockheed uh, crashed two in a row, proving some kind of point. It's, it's lost on me. And in reaction to that, NASA picked Ball. 
Well, Paul's a defense contractor, so they came in with a, a proposal for around 80 or 90 million dollars, not 25. <clears throat> During negotiation, uh, rumor has it that they jacked the price up to close to 150 million, and in the meantime, because of the two crashes, um, <clears throat> the whole Mars program was put on hold, the contractors terminated uh, the negotiations with Ball, and thank goodness, because the Mars micro missions are still a possibility, although they're no longer even on the Mars uh, agenda. So <clears throat> at that point, we're sitting there with Boeing, looking at each other, saying, well, what are we going to do? And an unnamed vice president uh, literally pounded the table and he said, what's the cheapest, least expensive, fastest, uh, least risky, profitable mission beyond Earth orbit with no NASA involvement? What can we do? And that would launch in January of 2001. That's inauguration day for a new president. So that was like to make a point. Well, of course, Inauguration Day 2001 is kind of gone, and we haven't launched uh, uh, a mission. However, we said to Boeing, without doubt, a lunar orbiter. Because this little spacecraft, we have a uh, celestial mechanic uh, on, on board uh, who's a highly experienced guy, and he looked at this and he said, this mission, this design, spacecraft design, design can do 15 interplanetary missions. This is what I've been looking for, the same spacecraft design that you could use over and over again and make it more and more reliable. The software gets better and the, the reliability goes up and the cost goes down. So we told Boeing, use this data relay orbiter to go to the moon and not to Mars. So this uh, antenna and radio equipment, which would do 10 kilobits per second, a quarter of a billion miles, uh, sent to the moon, only a quarter of a million miles would do 10 megabits per second which is enough to do uh, twin streams of uh, live streaming television. So Boeing said okay, and they spent about a third of a million dollars with us uh, taking these mission designs and running it all the way into a, uh, a total and complete uh, uh, commercial Mars orbiter program. Next slide, please. So the um, commercial lunar orbiter mission, it would be in a polar lunar orbit. Uh, we would start off about 200 kilometers in altitude and we would step it down about 20 or 40 kilometers uh, every 20 and a half days as we went around. And uh, we would eventually get down to the point where we were as low as or lower than Alan took the lunar prospector. And um, basically at some point we would uh, pick a target like uh, Alan did and crash it into that point. But in the meantime, we'd be getting a year or more of live streaming HDTV with a pan tilt zoom camera that people over the internet could control one at a time. We'd have an email server on so you could bounce email off the moon. And uh, we would allow people, when they're looking on the internet, they would see the live stream 24 hours a day going by. Uh, sometimes it would be good quality, sometimes less quality, depending on the sun angles and that sort of thing. But the little viewer in the browser would be like the back of the camera looking through the viewfinder with a little shutter button on it. And if they slip their credit card in and hit the shutter button, they get that frame. And uh, nobody else would. So uh, they could have their own unique pictures of uh, the moon in very high resolution. We've also talked to the guy that runs the Lunar Embassy. Are you familiar with that? He's been selling property on the moon for like 20 years. <laughs> it's an incredible deal. I mean, you can buy like a, you know, I don't know, uh, hundreds of acres for, for $47.99. And the guy's literally sold $6 million worth of property on the moon. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the key advocate of private property rights in space, but, you know, the moon and 4977 or whatever, it's, uh, well, but nevertheless, he's got this huge base of a few tens of thousands of people that have actually bought land on the moon, or, you know, they've got a certificate saying they have. So we went to him and we said, do you think they'd like to buy a picture of their, their, uh, their homestead? And, uh, you know, that would actually be a significant revenue source if all those people just bought a $15 picture and almost paid for the entire mission. So anyway, that's just a, a more uh, amusing uh, revenue stream. But we did go into great depth and hired outside consultants to explore all the revenue streams from cable, pay-per-view, broadcast, uh, internet, and uh, corporate sponsorships for name rights, product rights, and, um, and other things. So we have spent uh, an awful lot of time and money. And the point I'm making here is that this has been underway since 96, and we've been through four iterations ever more detailed uh, in terms of coming up with the engineering and the cost data. Let's see if there's a the next slide, please. Uh, oh, just, as, just an aside, uh, all these wonderful pictures you just picked up over here, talk about land rush. Um, 
And those pictures, those pictures are taken by Mike Malin's camera. Well, Mike is in La Jolla, just a few minutes from us, and he came into us uh, last year and said, would you please design a mission for me in a spacecraft? And under contract, we designed a mission for him that would basically fly out to uh, Jupiter and do a flyby of the uh, Trojan point uh, trailing uh, Jupiter as it goes around. And that was submitted to the Discovery Program, and it was well received and critiqued, and it will be back again. So Space Dev may very well be uh, flying this mission to, uh, to Jupiter in a few years. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, so, we want to partner up with NASA. I said earlier that there are three ways to explore space, government, private, or joint. An example of joint is there's a, an armada of things going to Mars over the next several years. NASA wants to spend a billion dollars building telecommunications infrastructure. They actually want to put a little constellation around Mars so that they can do the data relay back to Earth. And we're sitting here with Boeing and others saying, wait a minute, why would Mars be in a commercial business of building a communication infrastructure when this is something that we are willing and able to go out and do now, and we'll simply sell the service to Boeing, uh, to uh, NASA, and it'll take all the risk off of them, and they'll only pay for what they use. And if we fail, they don't pay anything. So their risk goes to zero, and they can take their money and put it into real scientific exploration and not try to co-opt industry by putting communications uh, uh, abilities elsewhere when that can and should be done commercially. So uh, I've already mentioned the three Mars missions that we're working on. Next, please. This is a quote from me. And it's true. Next. Uh, we have a 25,000 square foot uh, building. We have uh, 25 uh, engineers. Uh, to, uh, 10 of them are propulsion and uh, launch vehicle engineers. The other uh, 10 or 12 are spacecraft and satellite engineers. And we have a uh, large clean room. Uh, we are responsible for uh, the CHIPSAT mission, which is the smallest, least expensive mission NASA has ever attempted. And when NASA was approving Berkeley's awarding of the contract to us, the head of the University Explorer Program at NASA headquarters said, I'm excited about allowing Space Dev to do this because there's not a single company in the United States that can do missions this small and this inexpensive, and NASA needs little companies able to do the inexpensive missions like this. And in our second year of existence, we were awarded the first in the series of the University Explorer missions and allowed to do that. For $4.9 million, we've designed the mission, designed the spacecraft, build it, test it, integrate the instrument, launch integration, and mission control and operations for an entire year. $4.9 million fixed price contract. Next, please. Uh, is there another one? I guess that's the end of it. I thought there was one more slide on there. Um, I just have another couple of minutes. And what I want to say is that the exploration can be done and should be done by the private sector wherever it makes sense. I know there are exciting and important things to be done at the moon, and you're going to hear Alan Binder talking about uh, his strategy and plan uh, for continuing the work that he's already been working on. We have missions that could be literally flown to Mars uh, 18 months any, after starting. It's a matter of funding. You have to put together the revenue sources in order to pay for the mission. I mean, it's just a bottom line deal. There is a, do you, those of you who are old enough to remember, do you remember the doctors and physiologists said for decades that the human body is incapable of running a mile in less than four minutes? Well, what happened? Bannister went out and did it. And it turned out that that barrier was psychological. Once it was done, people said, oh, I can do that, it can be done, I can do that. And now a uh, four minute mile is not that big a deal. I, I've never, I'll never do it, but lots of people do. Believe me, commercial missions beyond Earth orbit, the only barrier is psychological. The Boeing Space Dev study that we put an incredible amount of effort into we used Monte Carlo simulations on the variation of expenses and revenues and used their most sophisticated business model. You know what we came up with? An 80% probability 
an 80% probability of making a return on the investment of between 25 and 60%. That is not a bad deal. <laughs> However, there's a psychological block in getting someone to step forward first and say, yes, I will put $5 million in and be the naming sponsor on this. Or for an investor to come in and say, I'll put down the $10 million, but I don't give it to you until you accomplish these milestones, but as you accomplish those milestones, the money comes in. We can do a lunar orbiter 18 months from the date uh, that we get started. We can do small, inexpensive, simple Mars missions 18 months from the get-go. So what we're up against now is purely a psychological thing, and once that barrier drops, it's Katie barred the door. The solar system is open for us to explore uh, robotically with people, the moon, I like near the asteroids, Mars. There's a whole solar system out there. It's big enough for all of us. And that means government and commercial and working together. There's just so much out there. We really are uh, almost overwhelmed by insurmountable opportunities. We're just ready to break the barrier. And, uh, and space is going to happen. And this is the year that's going to happen. Thank you very much.